thank you all for being here. I know you could be out enjoying one of our first nice days of the spring or home watching a recordings of the coronation, which they didn't check with me before they, uh, <laughs> before they, uh, you know, anyway. So yes, I'm going to be talking about companion planting today. And I do want to say that after this presentation, I will have my required hours to actually be a master gardener rather than a master gardener intern. So thank you. Assuming this goes well. <laughs> they may set me back 10 hours, but anyway, so. Okay, so a brief overview of my talk. I'm going to be going over what companion planting is, why it's important, what it can do for you, and how it will benefit the environment. And I'll give you some examples of companion planting. And then a final thought that not all garden pests are bad. They may be bad for what you're planting, but they are good for the garden and the environment. So there's some things you can do to kind of uh, mitigate the damage that they do without actually getting rid of them so they can go on and do the wider good that they were, that they're supposed to do. So companion planting is the planting and growing of different plant species near each other so they mutually benefit each other. So there's that symbiotic, I'm going to use a science word here, symbiotic relationship. There's a give and return, give and take with each other. It's considered, I don't know if you've ever heard of the word polyculture. It's where you're growing one or more crop species in the same space at the same time. And that's compared to a monoculture where it's just one. Why is this important? Well, you can manage pests, you can manage disease, weed control, you can improve your soil health, you can use less chemicals, which is great for the environment, you can utilize more space. I don't know about you, but I don't have a huge yard, or I don't have, I should rephrase that, I have about an acre, but not all of it is in an optimal place for growing. I only have a small area that gets optimal sun conditions and has decent soil that I could use. So with companion planting, you can utilize your space as well. And with companion planting, plants will protect each other. So there's a lot of benefits to companion planting. Let's talk about pest management. I'm sure you guys have seen some of these uh, little critters here. So we have our, our cabbage worm here. I'm sure you've seen those on your, your cabbage and your broccoli plants. And we have some aphids and some, the, to, the infamous tobacco hornworm that show up on tomato plants. Well, with companion planting, you can plant plants together where one plant will, through odors and scents, will repel pests from attacking a companion plant or you could use a plant as a trap plant. So you could take a plant and plant it somewhere else in your garden to, to draw the pests to that plant, its preferred host species, away from your plant of interest or the plant that you want to grow. They also act as visual distractions from your plant of interest. And I'll be talking more about these pests, especially the tobacco hornworm. It's actually one of my favorite pests because it turns into something very beautiful. Disease control. Here's that word polyculture again. Diseases are less prominent in polyculture because this disease, there's this thing called the disease diversity hypothesis. The greater the diversity, so the more plants, the more types, different species of plants you have in an area, the decrease in severity of some of your diseases. So different plants are susceptible to different diseases. So your overall impact of the disease, the impact is, is contained. So um, I have an example here of some uh, lesions on peppers and the late blight lesion on a tomato leaf. Weed control. Multiple species planting takes up space that would otherwise be used for, for weeds. So you can use companion planting as a living mulch and it'll help shade out competing weeds. But you want to be careful because you don't want your living mulch to compete with your desired crop. 
So I have an example here of a very weedy garden, and then this is actually <coughs> my home garden from a couple years ago. I use raised beds because my soil isn't all that great. So I find that raised beds are very benefit, and I have companion plant. I use a lot of uh, different flowers in my garden to ward off different pests and so on and so forth. So soil health, this is very, very important. So tubers like carrots and rutabagas and stuff like that, the tap roots help break up soil compaction, but they also pull water and nutrients from deeper in the soil profile up to some of the more shallow rooted plants. So planting a, a deeper a carrot with another one of its companion plantings will help benefit each other by making the nutrients and the water available for the other plant. There's also nitrogen fixation. I'll talk a little bit about the three sisters. I don't know if anybody has heard about that, but it's where you plant corn, beans, and squash together. And that's a, an example of a very ancient companion planting situation. And what happens is, is that the bean plants will fix nitrogen from the air, and the, there are microbes the microbes actually fix the nitrogen on these little nodules at the roots of the bean plants, and then that nitrogen becomes available for the corn and the other um, plants that you're planting. Cover crops also help to choke out weeds and add organic matter to your soil. Another thing is, is you can decrease the use of pesticides and fertilizers, which is very important. If you decrease pests, you, have, you use less pesticides. If you rely on other plants to help the growth of your desired crop, that means less fertilizers are used. So, and if less fertilizers, less chemicals are used, that, that decreases the chance of nitrites and other contamination into our overall water table, which is very important. Now, onto the fun part, some examples of companion planting. The Three Sisters, I just mentioned it. This is something that has been going on for hundreds, probably thousands of years. It first emerged in Mesoamerica, and that's basically where the corn will provide a support, a trellis for bean plants, and then the beans will fix the nitrogen in the soil, and then the squash will provide shade for the roots of all the other vegetables and be a deterrent to pests. I'm actually going to try this for the very first time in our community garden in Painesville, Red Raider Garden. I don't know if anybody has heard about it, but it is available if you want to get a plot there. Check, it, check us out on Facebook. I'm actually going to try this for the very first time because I'm very intrigued about it. Plus, I don't have room to grow corn in my yard and I want to grow corn. <laughs> but it's been utilized by many indigenous peoples, the Pueblos, the Mandan, and the Iroquois. So tomatoes, let's talk about some friends and some foes. Tomatoes and basil go together in our kitchen really, really well. They're delicious, but they also grow together very, very well. So the basil will benefit the root growth and act as a pest repellent for your tomato plants. Marigolds and nasturtiums are wonderful pest repellents for tomatoes and a lot of other vegetables. And carrots, celery, lettuce, and spinach are other wonderful friends to a tomato. Foes. So cabbage. Cabbage will be a nutrient, uh, will be in competition for nutrition and has been shown to inhibit the growth of tomatoes. So you don't want to plant your cabbage and your tomatoes together. Beets, again, beets and peas and fennel are, have been shown to inhibit the growth of tomatoes. You'll see a theme through here that fennel is, doesn't really play nice with a lot of other plants. So fennel is something you kind of want to plant away from everything by itself if you, if you like fennel. Older dill is another plant that has been shown to inhibit the growth of tomatoes. For some reason, young dill plants do not do that. But I, I don't know about you, I'm not going to go put dill in my tomatoes and when they start to get old, which I don't know when that is, when they maybe start to, to go to seed and then dig them up and put them somewhere else. Corn is not a good one for tomatoes because of the corn earworm will attack your tomato plants. 
and then potatoes because they suffer from a, the same blight as tomatoes. So things, plants that suffer from the same sorts of disease, you don't necessarily want to put together because they will possibly pass that disease on to each other. Peppers, <coughs> friends of peppers, basil again, and onion, both of these repel pests. Spinach will improve the soil nutrition and act as a weed suppression. Tomatoes are good with peppers. They like the same pH of soil. And mar again, marigolds and nasturtiums act as a pest repellent. And then carrots, not only is that a wonderful tap root that breaks up the soil structure, but the carrot leaves provide a wonderful living mulch for the bottom parts of, of your peppers. Foes, again, fennel. You don't want to put fennel because it's going to inhibit the growth of your peppers. And any of your brassica family, so your cabbages and your um, broccoli and so on, you don't want to plant them near your peppers because they prefer a different pH level, there's a nutrient comp uh, competition, and they also attract pests that might damage your peppers. Cucumbers. Cucumbers like beans because of the nutrient fixation in the soil. They like celery. Celery has been shown to fight off white flies, which will attack cucumbers. And uh, corn, again, corn acting as a trellis, again, for these vining vegetables, not only for beans, but for, for cucumbers. And they provide a shade, shade for cucumbers. Lettuce, because it's low to the ground, will act as a living mulch. And dill, attracts a wasp that prey on cucumber beetles. So if you have dill nearby, that's going to attract a parasitic wasp that will actually eat the beetles that want to prey on your, on your cucumbers. Peas, again, nitrogen fixation. Your legumes are gonna fix the nitrogen. Radishes attract the cucumber beetles away from cukes. And again, our friends marigold and nasturtium. Foes are potatoes, nutrient competition, fennel, growth uh, inhibition, your brassicas, and melons for space competition. And they suffer from similar pests. Lettuce. Mint will deter slugs, which are a big problem with uh, lettuce. But you got to be careful with mint, because once you plant one mint plant, you'll have mint forever. So it's probably best to keep that in pots. I have mint in my garden everywhere, and I planted it probably 15 years ago, and I am not trying to actively grow mint. And I've actually dug up plants near the mint and transplanted them to other places in my yard. So I have mint forever. If you ever need mint, <laughs> come see me. Chives and garlic will repel aphids, and sometimes your friends. Beans, again, because of the nit uh, nitrogen fixation, and beets to help uh, retain moisture in the soil. And then, uh, again, carrots to draw nutrients to the top of the soil. And then our friends, nasturtiums and marigolds and onions. You see that the, the, the plants and the herbs that have strong odors are really good at, at uh, pest deterrent. Foes anything in your um, brassica family, and because of the nutrient competition. Onions. Friends are carrots. They repel the leek moth and onion flies. Beets, cabbage. Lettuce, because of their shallow roots and that uh, living mulch. Tomatoes and summer savory. Foes are asparagus, beans, peas, because of growth um, inhibition and sage because they just they're differing growing conditions. Green beans, friends, corn of course, members of the cabbage family, cucumbers, marigolds, nasturtiums, and summer savory. Foes are anything from the alum family, so any of your onions and uh, garlics. They produce a plant that will actually, a substance that actually kills the bacteria that is responsible for fixing the nitrogen at the roots. 
And if, you, if you're planting pole beans, you don't want to uh, plant beets. And I didn't know this. This, is, this, is, this points to the fact that as somebody, even if you know, think you know a lot about gardening, there's always more to learn. I didn't know that you really shouldn't plant your bush beans and pole beans together until I did my research. So you don't want to plant your bush beans and pole beans together. What is the allium family? What is that? So that's like your onions and your garlic, things like that. Uh, chives. chives. Okay. Yeah. Carrots. Tomatoes, they actually provide shade for the carrots, and the carrots actually provide shade for the, the roots of the tomatoes, the bottom part of the tomatoes. Onions will repair the carrot fly. Rosemary also rep uh, repels the, the carrot fly, as well as sage and chive. Marigolds and nasturtiums are pest repellents. And radishes are great because they're something that you can harvest before your carrots come up and mature, and they will loosen the soil around your carrots. Foes are coriander, that produces harmful compounds. Dill, again, same reason, and parsnips, because they suffer from the same diseases. So I want to talk a little bit about trap crops. So a trap crop is something that you can plant away from your garden to help pull certain pests from your garden and trap them. So a couple good trap crops are things like dill, which will get the eastern black swallowtail, uh, swallowtail caterpillar, which might otherwise want to munch on some of your veggies. Zinnias and geranium will attract Japanese beetles. Nasturtiums, aphids, Sunflowers attract stink bugs, and I didn't know this until I started researching this, and that's good to know. I love sunflowers. Fennel, the eastern black swallowtail caterpillar also loves fennel. And tomatoes, tobacco horn hornworms. Now, you're probably thinking, well, why would I want to plant some tomatoes and have them devastated by tobacco hornworms? And I'll show you why later. So, I'm, I've actually decided this year to not only have my tomatoes for eating, but I'm actually going to plant intentionally a bed out back that has fennel by itself, dill, and tomatoes specifically to attract some of these pests because they end up turning into very important pollinators and beneficial inse insects. And because I also like to watch the life cycle of these things as well. And then I figure, you know, maybe I'll get something from it too. They won't eat everything, right? So I can go back there and harvest some, maybe some tomatoes that they haven't munched on that, or killed or some fennel. I love fennel, but I don't want to put it anywhere in my, in my raised beds because it doesn't play nice with a lot of my other stuff. So, you know, maybe I'll share it with some of these, uh, some of these pests. So two companion plants that I have in my garden without fail are marigolds and nasturtiums because they do excellent jobs of repelling pests, they attract pollinators, and they are delicious. I don't know if anybody's ever eaten them, but they're wonderful. If you like sort of a very subtle peppery taste, Pick a nasturtium flower and munch on it. It's delicious. It's wonderful added to salads, and they're gorgeous, and they come in so many different colors. I have grown the uh, Alaska in my garden. Just absolutely gorgeous. And then, of course, marigolds as well. So if you're going to plant anything as a companion plant, pick, get marigolds and nasturtiums. Not only are they visually pleasing, they do a great job of repelling pests, and you can eat them. Do you have any suggestion as to where to place them, around the edge or within the... Good question. Nasturtiums and, and marigolds I actually put in my boxes at the edge of my boxes. of my. Um, and then if I have any left over, because I like to start them from seed, I'll just stick them in a random pot and just place them around. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is kind of a silly question, but marigolds, 
Yes. Are, um, I have taken classes uh, the same way in the past, and they specified French. Uh, right. You know, I didn't ask the marigold what. French marigold, yeah, French marigolds, from what I have read, do a better job of deterring pests than the other. And I think it has to do with the scent that they give off. Okay. Yeah. So if you can get French marigolds, that would be good. Yeah. So not all garden pests are bad. So the dreaded tobacco hornworm, which I actually think is actually very beautiful, actually ends up being the beautiful sphinx moth. So if you see a tobacco hornworm on your tomato plants, I encourage you not to kill it and stomp it and make a gooey mess. But if you can transfer it to, maybe you've planted a tomato plant out back in a garden in an area that you, you know, don't really care about, maybe put it on that and let it have a home. Because we need more of these gorgeous sphinx moths. I don't know if you've ever seen one in nature, but they're absolutely beautiful. Are they the ones that make you think you're looking at? A hummingbird, yes, exactly, yep, yep. And then likewise, the black swallowtail caterpillar end up being an eastern black swallowtail butterfly. So this is, this is the reason, and, and I'll tell you, this last year I had some dill in my garden and we saw a ton of these beautiful black swallowtail caterpillars and I had never seen them before. So I got out my little Seek app. Seek is an app that you can get on your phone and you can identify plants and insects and all different sorts of things and, and learn about them. And it identified the black swallowtail caterpillar. And so I did some research and I thought, oh, this is absolutely wonderful. Then I saw these, wonderful, these horrible little wasps the next day around them and all my black swallowtail caterpillars had been eaten by the wasps. So not only did I lose my dill, I lost my beautiful black swallowtail caterpillars. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm going to plant an area that I'm hopefully going to just load it with some dill, another area, load it with fennel, and then I, I always start a ton of tomatoes, so I'll, I always have extra tomato plants, and I'll put them out back and just sort of let nature take its course. I have another question, too. <laughs> Um, I have dill, I mean not dill, the other one. Fennel? Oh, yeah. I love it. Uh, it. As you know, it gets pretty big and mm -hmm. it keep it down, but also when it gets too many fronds on there. So what part does the eastern uh, black, uh, uh, you know, swallowtail like? I mean, wh wh what do they go after, the flower, the, the stem? I think they go after the stems, the actual frond part, but I do not know for sure. Okay. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. You know, because of aesthetics, I, I clip a lot of things. Right. I lose the, perhaps the part that they're... Yeah. Know, that they're I think, doing. so uh, what, they're, what they're doing is they're eating it, but they're also, it, 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 it can be, uh, I'm not sure, but they may put their chrysalis there as well. Yeah. So a place that becomes a home yeah. for them. So these are citations to show you that I didn't make this up. <laughs> um, I'm not that smart. <laughs> See? And do you have any questions? Yes? Can you find these sheets online? Yes. Yes, you can. Now, I would love to have brought you a nice, cute little diagram that says, you know, plant this with that. But being a master gardener, I want to give you information that is correct and is backed by science. So what I suggest that you do is you go online and you type in, before you do your search, what can I plant with tomatoes, type in site.edu. And what that's going to do is that's going to bring up extension sites, sort of like OSU extension or other extension sites. And that's going to give you information that we know is scientifically true. So there's a lot of, you can go and get a wonderful, beautiful chart, which I have used in the past, from the far Farmer's Almanac. So a lot of this is known just by trial and error. And by all means, trial and error is how we learn, right? By all means, follow that. But um, if you want to know exactly why, you know, something is benefiting something else and know that it is scientifically proven, you want to look for these sites that are the, like the OSU extension site or 
Nebraska is another good one. I found a lot of information from Florida, but if you can kind of keep local to the ones local to the Midwest, that's best. So there is a ton of information. There's also books in the library here, I'm sure, that you could check out. Is it site with a C or site with an S? With an S. With an S. Yes. You mentioned not planting bush beans and pole beans together. Mm -hmm. Why? I do not. I just read that and, and I just, yeah. I'll I've be, always done that. Too, I've, I've, I, you know, I've done it too. I just read somewhere you shouldn't do it and I need to look into that a little bit more. Yes. You think you shouldn't plant certain peppers together too? Something about the pollination of peppers, different kinds of peppers? Hot and sweet. Hot and sweet peppers? Separate? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is cinnamon good? I, I thought I've heard cinnamon? cinnamon? I have seen that, you know, I've seen like on Facebook that people put cinnamon at the, on the bottom to repel certain pests and stuff. I haven't seen any sort of scientific evidence or anything like that that, you know, that it is, but it doesn't mean that it's not out there. Yes? I'm surrounded by Camelon, all my neighbors. Mm, my yeah. Raised, they killed neighbors. <coughs> How much does that, I don't put anything in my yard. Right. How much does that affect my yard? Unfortunately, that really probably depends on how the wind is blowing that day. And then, of course, any sort of water runoff that comes from that. So it's, it's really hard to say. We're the same. We don't spray. We don't mow until June. And much to the chagrin of my neighbors, um, our grass is about this high and our dandelions. But I also harvest our dandelions for tea and, and, and to eat. So I don't want chemicals on it. I mean, yeah, I can't stop a squirrel from coming and doing its business on it or whatever. But um, I clean them before I, before I eat them. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're, you know, you're doing great by not doing, spraying your own yard. But there, there might be, especially at the, the border edge, you know, um, there's probably going to be some runoff from from, from the yard. What you might find is that by not uh, spraying in your yard, you're going to see a proliferation of certain pollinators and uh, in your yard where there'll be, you know, not that many in your neighbors. So you might be the envy of your neighbors because you're going to be having all these wonderful butterflies and interesting moths and stuff in your yard because they know it's a safe haven, right? Yeah. Yes. What was the name of the phony up that you said? Seek. S E E K. And you can get it for free. It works great. Yes, it's a wonderful, wonderful app. I, I was out foraging in the woods near the Vermilion River, and I was just, you know. You, what it does is it takes a picture, and it, it'll give you the species, the subspecies, and, and everything. And then it'll take you to a link and tell you all about it. Yeah. It does animals as well as plants. Yes? Do you have a preference? I noticed some of yours are in rows. Have you noticed, is it better to do clumps versus rows? And how do you determine where to put a companion plant? So this is, this is one of my uh, um, nasturtiums. And I just, that year, I decided to just kind of put them in the corner. I'm German, so I kind of like order. So, and, and I'm a little bit OCD as well, probably too much information, for, I'm telling you guys. So I, I, I tend to want to kind of line things up. But, you know, it really depends on the type of gardening you do. I know some people will do like a square foot gardening type situation. And, 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 I, and I think the square foot gardening me, uh, method will, will maybe suggest putting something like a nasturtium like smack down in the middle around certain things or, you know, it's, it's all preference, really. And, and you try it year after year, see what works. Take notes so you know, okay, this year, you know, I'm gonna put them here and then you n watch it throughout the season, see how it does. Any more questions? Yes. So using trap crops, um, do you, because well, I know that like aphids are will come to my nasturtium plants. Yes. 
but then it's like, well, aren't they then going to go, I mean, if I haven't put it far away, is it kind of like just attracting more? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, and again, I think it's, it's sort of, I have found by putting them in, in like at the edges that they tend to stay away from the plants that I want and they stay because they prefer like the nasturtiums, they'll stay on the nasturtiums. Occasionally they'll get on some of the other plants, but not as much as if I didn't have them at all. I mean, you could take and put the, like the nasturtiums and the other uh, plants away in a, in a separate pot and not directly neck, um, planted in, like for me, I do raised beds, maybe not putting them right directly in the raised bed, but in a pot beside them. Um, I've had luck that way too. You know, it's, it, it's trial and error. So, have you, do you have any suggestions? Nope, okay. No, because I mean, I, uh, I have a tendency to, once the nasturtium is so inundated by aphids that it's not doing anything, I just, bag it up and get rid, get of, rid of it. Of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you, if you plant enough of them, you can do that. Right. Yeah. But I think some of these plants, they prefer certain plants so much that they will leave the other ones alone. So something like a nasturtium or a marigold, they're attracted to that scent. So they're going to want to go there. It's more preferential for them to be there than on, than on the other. Yeah. Yes. So uh, Japanese beetles. Yes. I have one of those corkscrew trees, okay. stick trees. Okay. And a couple, two years ago, it was covered with beetles. And I'd go out and pluck them off. And I also was going around in the soil and digging up the grubs. So is that why I didn't have any beetles the next year? Or is it just random? Could, I mean, I'll, I'll could be. The soil and, and, and look for them. The grubs. grubs. Yeah. And or grubs. maybe you had a a nice little um, possum who also did that for you in, at oh, night I as well. Of yeah, yard. yeah. It's an unpoisoned yard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that could be, yeah. We didn't have a lot of Japanese beetles last year either. And um, we didn't, you know, we didn't, uh, um, we don't go out and dig up grubs. Um, so, what's that? They all came to, they all came to your yard? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we have had them in the past, and we've employed those Japanese beetle traps where, you, you know, they get in a bag, and then over the summer they ferment, and it smells, and then some yeah. raccoon will come along and eat the bag, and it'll be really gross. Actually, and those, those traps like that actually <laughs> attract them to your yard. Oh, yeah, that's, right, yeah. And, we, and I found that out the hard way when I was young and naive last year. No, um, many, many years ago, I stuck one. And I thought, okay, I'm going to stick one right in the middle of my vegetable garden, right down in the middle of it. And it's like, yeah, that's a nice trap crop right in the middle and everything just inundated. So if we have them, they're way out in the back. But yeah. Last month at asparagus yeah. class, she told us that Japanese beetles' favorite crop is grapes and roses. Really? Ah. Beans. And beans? And, 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 bra and brambles. That was me. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So their, their host or favorite crops of Japanese beetles are grapes, um, raspberries, blackberries, beans, and what was the fourth one I said? Roses. 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 Yes. Wow. Okay. For I only remembered the ones in my yard, I'm sorry. Yeah, so what she said, though, was that trap crops are, are zinnias and geraniums, so they like those too. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the, the first four, they will, they, they are very much attracted. Are they? Okay. Okay, yeah. And they will actually draw them. Once they're in your yard, then you can use the zinnias and geraniums to, as traps. To keep, okay, yeah. See, this is what I like about these classes is that we can all learn from each other based on our experience and knowledge. And we, yes. Um, I know we, I think at least I've heard about how they rotate the crops. Yes. Do we have any foresight with our smaller gardens that we want to change up the vegetables from time to time? 
Yeah, I think to a certain extent, yes. I mean, I, I never really plant my tomatoes in, certainly not in the same soil, because a lot of times certain um, soil-borne illnesses will collect in the soil, and so you don't want to, you know, um, and then also one reason for rotating crops is soil nutrient. If you nutrients, if you're depleting the soil from one year to the next, you want to maybe plant something that's going to give back to that soil, um, so you don't have to necessarily amend it. You know, you, yeah, move things around, right? But uh, if you're limited by you know the amount of sun your your garden gives you, that may be a little bit difficult. Yeah, so that's another nice thing about companion planting is that you can plant plants together that that can kind of feed each other and, and benefit each other. Yes? If your yard has been sprayed in the past, how long do you need to wait? I cannot tell you that. I don't, I don't know that information, but I'm sure that if you were to go online, like to the Ohio State Extension, there should be some information about that, but I, I, I said, does anybody know? Anybody here know? I think it depends a little bit on what it was sprayed with. Yeah. Because um, there are some things that will, will stay in the soil for up to 10 years and other things that are just 10 weeks. Yeah. Yes? So I don't do a lot of vegetable gardening just because I never had good success. I do flowers and will these, this type of premise still work with the flowers to help? Yes, them. certainly, and to a certain the same extent. Type of like marigold, same thing? Yes, yes, and herbs. You could work some herbs into um, your uh, flowers okay. as well and get some benefit there because a lot of the herbs will uh, repel. I see the have a huge problem with like earwigs and things like that getting up in my flowers. And okay, just, yeah. Do I'm, they have a benefit? The earwigs? Earwig? I don't know. I've always, I always. feed something. Yeah. <laughs> They, they creep me out, I know that. I'm always afraid they're going to get in my ear because they're earwigs. I think that's because my mom always said, oh, you got potato bugs in your ear or something, you know? Yes? With the uh, Three Sisters planting, yes. you know it says green beans. How about beans like kidney beans and, and mac beans? Does that work with that also? So the, uh, the idea is to have a vining bean, a pole bean, okay. yeah, because to take advantage of the corn stalks as, as a trellis, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, 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 and also the beans are going to, any of your legumes are going to fix the nitrogen in your soil. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. This was my first time doing this, and I appreciate your patience and the fact that you are here today. And um, please uh, consider the Master Gardener program, and um, I encourage you to just get out there and get your hands in the dirt. It increases the serotonin in our brains, and that's always a good thing. So thank you again.